disappointed! If you're holding out hope that a new Zelda game will somehow bridge the gap between classic and modern 3D Zelda, you'll probably be waiting for another 5 plus years. We don't get these games very often now, so the desire to enjoy them increases. True to its marketing, Tears of the Kingdom is a purebred sequel to Breath of the Wild, continuing the story, gameplay, and design philosophy that blew people away back in 2017, setting a higher standard for open world games forevermore. I think most fans recognize this as the beginning of a new era for Zelda, but exactly how it would develop remained to be seen. Scene. Despite my efforts to avoid spoilers in the lead-up to Tears of the Kingdom, I was exposed to a couple worrying details. However, I did my best to shelve any expectations before playing. Ironically, and perhaps foolishly, I went into Tears of the Kingdom with only one wish, for it to not feel like Breath of the Wild 2.0. The game opens on an escort mission slowly following Zelda as she spouts exposition, and I'd be happy if I never have to do stuff like this in a video game ever again. Thankfully, we're separated not long after, and I'm exploring these Sky Islands, acquiring some admittedly bonkers new abilities. Ultra Hand, which allows moving and sticking objects together for wacky contraptions, and Fuse, which combines materials with weapons for special effects. And the game really, really hopes players will have fun experimenting with these because there are constant opportunities to do so whether it's necessary or not. After settling back into the controls, physics, and gameplay loop, I progress through the Temple of Time, where the clouds veiling Hyrule below disperse, and I am prompted to head for the kingdom. This is the moment that broke me. As I jumped off that platform skydiving back down to Hyrule, my enthusiasm sank along with Link, and all I could think to myself was, really? Are we really abandoning the promise of a dedicated Zelda adventure in the sky again in favor of a land that many of us have spent literal hundreds of hours exploring already? After six years, this is supposed to be the next big entry in the series? Did I actually just pay $70 for a glorified expansion? I understand there's no rule for how different sequels must be to be considered a new game. And yes, plenty has changed since 2017, but never before has the deja vu been this inescapable. The first thing I saw when touching down was the remains of Lon Lon ranch, punctuating the disappointing familiarity I was feeling. Good to be back, I guess. Despite adhering to a similar formula, 3D Zelda games used to be very separate from one another, whether in art style, setting, tone, or story. For me, that was the fun of being a fan. Each is a special experience that hits different emotionally and artistically. Majora's Mask, the canonical sequel to Ocarina of Time, had a brand new world, a bizarre premise, and crazy time mechanics that completely transform how that game is played to the point where its connection to Ocarina is entirely irrelevant. Reusing assets didn't stop Majora from becoming beloved as one of the most unique Zeldas. Even the most derivative entry, Twilight Princess, has a distinct personality from the darker, more detailed graphics to everything involving the Twilight, Wolf Link, Midna, and more. Playing Tears of the Kingdom, Breath of the Wild is all I could think about, and the comparisons it invites aren't always favorable. In general, Tears of the Kingdom is a fatter, sloppier, tedious remix. Lots of bells and whistles, but deceptively little additional substance. It kind of assumes you've already played Breath of the Wild, and I'm going to do the same in this video. That game ensures players won't leave the Great Plateau without the paraglider recognizing how essential it is. Here, players are expected to progress the campaign further in order to get it, leaving those unaware to miserably try exploring without it. This is such a baffling backward step, especially with the greater emphasis on air travel and how it's practically required for shrines without some serious shenanigans. The new abilities are so versatile that half the time I'm convinced I'm solving puzzles in unintentional ways, which begins to feel less like I'm outsmarting the game and more like the developers gave up balancing everything and stopped caring how and when players approached their challenges. Gliding in Breath of the Wild used to be a reward for scaling tall places, but here there are so many opportunities to gain height that it's no longer special or exciting. Replacing Divine Gifts is the shockingly clumsier system of Sage Summons. They're never nearby when I need them and always around when I don't, obstructing my view and getting in the way. I don't know why the Zelda team decided to continue Breath of the Wild's story and characters because they weren't that interesting to begin with. The main quests follow predictable formats ending by regurgitating the same Imprisoning War spiel that holds little significance. The memories are still too disconnected from gameplay to have any meaningful impact as the player. Gen Dorf's rise looks cool, too bad I wasn't there to experience it. I don't ultimately care much for narrative, but it's not a good sign if I'm skipping every cutscene and not listening to an ounce of dialogue. Whether or not you've played Breath of the Wild before, it's a lose-lose. Without it, the scenarios and character moments are less coherent. Having played it, the advantage of carrying over my prior knowledge comes at the cost of far fewer surprises, sucking the magic out of discovering Hyrule secrets for the first time. As a package, Breath of the Wild can seem comparatively quaint, but that's partially because 
because it's not bloated with as much repetitive filler content. Open world games have been AAA Studios' go-to for over a decade, and the novelty of expansive, seamless exploration wore off for me long ago, compounded by the fact that I have less time than ever to commit to these gargantuan investments. The scope of a game's world is not nearly as important as how that space is used. If it can't be populated with enough unique content, then I'd much prefer it shrunk for a more concise adventure. Though imperfect, the older Zelda titles had content laid out like the developers actually wanted me to see and do it all. As an adult, I don't take my time for granted, so to be presented with the same busy work all over again in a supposed new game is kind of insulting. I've never been so selective about the content I choose to pursue. From the moment I spotted a suspicious rock, I said out loud, oh please no. Yeah! He's back! He's back! Yeah, he's, he's back! I've been ignoring Koroks and signpost boys like the plague, and I had only done 20% of the depths before losing interest. Exploring Hyrule used to be the driving force because I never knew what I'd find. Here I know exactly what to expect, and somehow this works wonders to demotivate my curiosity, though for all the similarities, the difference in my approach this time around has been very telling. My hero's path says it best, with one taking an organic course through the landscape and the other constantly warping to towers so I can just fly straight to my destination. Without the thirst for exploration, I'm mostly left with the new abilities like Ultra Hand, the mileage of which depends greatly on creativity and patience for the janky physics, mechanics, and controls. It's easy to waste time fiddling around accomplishing nothing. I could spend 10 minutes building a sophisticated invention that may or may not work, or I could slap together some utter garbage in 2 minutes that may or may not work. I fail to see how Fuse fixes weapon durability. Most weapon pickups are rusted now, and enemies sport sticks and clubs even into late game, necessitating Fuse just to make tools worth it darn, and they still break like mad. If anything, weapons are less of a reward since they're never as important as whatever they're fused with, and because these fusions basically function like items, breakage sucks even more. While imbuing weapons and arrows with special properties is cool, having to do it for each one introduces a level of tedium that gets tiring and ruins the flow of the action. Link's inventory is so darn disposable it's impossible to feel any lasting sense of reward or fulfillment. I just don't understand what the design goals for this thing were supposed to be. Tears of the Kingdom is too dependent to stand on its own and not innovative enough to satisfy as a sequel. The relationship between these two is going to be so weird now. They cheapen each other. If you're enjoying Tears of the Kingdom, I want you to continue doing so. I don't take pride in being controversial and I'm not here to convince people or rain on anyone's parade. But after six years, I think it's fair to expect a lot better than this. I should hope it's obvious that none of this implies the game is bad. It's pretty hard to go wrong when piggybacking off a modern classic like Breath of the Wild. Judging by the overwhelming positive response, I'd say Nintendo definitely reached their target audience of Minecraft kit, I mean creative people. For a franchise of this caliber, it's tempting to believe it can do no wrong, and I expect mainstream reviewers know that pressure more than anyone. But we have to be willing to criticize if we want Zelda to thrive, or else there's nothing stopping Nintendo from recycling Hyrule again for subsequent full-priced releases. Look, I love Zelda. It's among my favorite things in the world, and the last thing I want is for that passion to be degraded. However, that's precisely what has happened. Maybe my opinions will change, but for now, my feelings don't lie. I'm disappointed with Tears of the Kingdom, and I sincerely hope we have better or different things to look forward to in the series' future.